We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that we really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovics. Joining me today is Kirian Van Hest, or Dezo for short. How are you today, Dezo? I'm doing just fine. How are you? Excellent. It's great to have you back. I wanted to kind of get an update for our listeners because we've had a lot of, uh, of questions on um, when we're going to get you back and to, to share with us some updates on the COMEX, um, as well as get your thoughts on your newest, latest and greatest prediction. So why don't we start by um, talking a little bit about what has happened since the, the first interview we did with you? Well, my career got started by that interview and I will forever be grateful. Uh, I had 135 subs uh, followers on Twitter when I went to bed and within half an hour, it basically doubled. I went up 10x in uh, within a day because I stayed up. Uh, well, I stayed up until I had a thousand followers on Twitter. Then within a day, I hit 1,350, and within 10 days, I hit 2,700. So, if anybody's ever wondered what's happened if you get on a channel uh, with 30,000 uh, subs when you're a complete unknown, things happen fast. Things happen fast. So uh, my career has gone off since then. I've done multiple interviews. You can now just search for me on YouTube. <laughs> oh, I love saying that. And um, I've been neck deep in research ever since. I've created my own website, desogames.com, and I've written uh, 83,000 words there about in, in, an, in a month. Uh, and the Shadow Contracts article, which deepens everything that uh, we talked about with two months of additional knowledge and data. Uh, it's 43,000 words, there are about 42,000 words and I wrote it in five days, just pure inspiration. Mm -hmm. And one, one thing I really appreciate about, about your, your mind and, and how you look at this data, Dezo, is that, that you have an ability to really look at it and absorb it, unlike anybody that I've ever talked to. So. Um, that that uh, shadow contracts article, uh, it is long. I, I went through all, you know, pretty much all forty three thousand words. But it is the yeah. most, the most in depth article about you know everything that's going on around this around this subject matter. Yeah, it took a lot of oh, it took just long to recover from just physically as it took to write it. But it's out there now, and it's gotten some very good reviews. Oh, that, that's another thing I hadn't expect. I, I thought that I was uh, at least going to get a few followers out of it, but I was going to fight the trolls until the battle was over, you know? It's not the case. The, the, uh, the responses have been almost universally positive. Even though I've been hammering on Tether and the whole Bitcoin thing on um, Twitter, even with that uh, taken into account, I think I'm up to 90 to 94 percent extreme positive reactions. I, I get reactions of "I love your research. Thank you for your research. Thank you that you're doing this. Thank you for persevering." Uh, and it's just, it's it's made me better. I even it gave me the strength to clean my house, uh, to just get a little bit of my health back, and just go deeper in research still. So yeah, I think it's important to to look at every one of these different uh, subjects that we're going to cover here, it's important to look at them from, from every side we can and, and try and test our assumptions and figure out where we might be wrong, where we might be right. And, you know, really try and figure out the, let's say objective answer to, to where all these different things are at. Indeed. I wish more people would just look at the data and just discuss the data and don't think, well, I think, or uh, I believe that no, just, let the data guide you. And if you're wrong, all that does is cost you a little bit of extra work on the next experiment. It's not a mistake. It's a learning opportunity. So there's nothing wrong, uh, bad about admitting you're wrong. In that shadow contracts article, I, in fact, almost start off with admitting that I was wrong because I called the comics cracking in August uh, because of the August contract and uh, it ended up living. So I was just flat out wrong. And the fact that they uh, tripled the amount of gold refineries to just make that two days before they had to deliver the contract, 
Well, clearly they were completely in a panic, but that doesn't make me any less wrong. But it's fine. I learned from it. I also learned that they uh, rolled over far more contracts than I thought possible before that. And because of that, I said that the comics wasn't going to collapse in September because they were going to roll over more silver contracts than expected. And that came true. So if you just look at the data, let the data guide you and fix your mistakes, learn from them and just go on. You end up like me, basically. So what happened with the December delivery wall as as we were looking at this this massive possible outflow out of the comics that that we were you know, worried about? Well, um, the one thing that my prediction was relying on mainly was uh, insane doomsday demand. I figured this was back in September that uh, stimulus would come, that they would not hold an entire economy hostage just for a few more votes. Uh, But I was wrong on that as well. So the stimulus hasn't come yet, which means a lot of people don't have money to spend. So they also don't have money to put in silver. Um, However, however, I still believe I was right in my original prediction that all roads led to December because there was indeed a big, big change in the pattern. Up to the week, up to leading uh, the December deliveries in the November contract, which is not an active contract and usually very thinly traded, they added 5,198 contracts. In the fir- since the first day of delivery, the first week of delivery of the December gold contracts, they removed 2,500 contracts. After that, the shadow contracts returned. Why? Why would they add 5,000 contracts plus for immediate delivery in November if they're not going to make additional contracts in December. And it gets worse because ever since then, contracts, shadow contracts in December gold have only appeared sparingly. Most have actually rolled over to the next month or the next active month. And that is a complete break from October gold where it had shadow contracts every day, even though more than 30,000 delivered. And November, which it had shadow contracts pretty much every day, though I didn't check gold every day. Uh, I did check silver. And again, last week of uh, November trading, more than 5,000 additional contracts, first week of December, minus 2,000. And there haven't been more than, I think, four or 500 added in gold since uh, December started, but there have been a heck of a more that have been rolled over. Why would they roll over if they have the metal? The uh, another weird thing has happened is that the um, delivery or their stocks that they post on the website have not changed at all with the deliveries, or like at least not at a, I have seen in the first few days where about uh, 13,000, 14,000, 15,000 contracts delivered, it didn't change at all. However, when um, six, uh, 16,000 contracts in silver were uh, uh, or standing for delivery and 11,000 were delivered in the same day. That was about 60 million ounces of silver and 33 million ounces of silver changed on the balance sheet. Well, aside from that being a huge discrepancy, that is a major problem. Uh, If we just take the ratio, all right, well, half of the stuff that's delivered should show up on the balance sheet. But none of the stuff uh, that's been delivered has shown on the balance sheet. There have been tiny changes. So the entire numbers are just one big fraud at this point, uh, designed to misdirect. They even have a legal disclaimer at the bottom say that they cannot verify the uh, authenticity of this information or the accuracy. And uh, everybody just thinks that it's just some sort of legal disclaimer that's just there for the lawyers. Uh, No, it's there because it has uh, legal value. So they have no idea how much gold they have. Nobody has any idea how much gold they have. And um, we're close. I know we're close. Ever since I started thinking about this, and even before we did the first video, I thought about being wrong because this is a very hard piece of time. It's very likely I get it wrong, just like everyone else. So what do my instincts say? Well, I could very well be wrong in December. I probably am still wrong in February. I might be wrong in April, but there's no way in the hell this is going to last beyond June next year. And as time has progressed, now with the December deliveries, with the scam wobbling, uh, meaning that uh, outside forces act on the scam 
which makes uh, things happen outside of um, the um, scam artist's control. Now that that has happened in December deliveries like I expected, even without the extra doomsday demand, it's very likely it'll collapse in uh, February. It probably won't be January and it most likely won't be December, but I can't time it much closer. We are very close to the end and this is not going to take more than half a year. I can get it that close. So what do you think that end game looks like, Dezo? When when that when that actual break, let's say, or inability to live, to deliver happens? Well, it's going to trigger something psychological. What the comics is going to try and avoid at all costs is a, a notice of failure to delivery. The moment that news message goes out into the world, every single person in the space, and probably most of you listening is going to find every scrap of silver and gold they can find and just buy empty the shops. Because that is the message everyone in the space has been waiting for, the day the comics runs out. So naturally, all the physical silver that is still left in the world is going to be snapped up by everybody who can, basically the first person to read the message, until the supply runs out. Uh, then the billionaires step in because they're just going to go directly to the mines because they have a lot of money. And they're going to buy everything up at a premium that gets produced further. So it's just going to be gone. Nobody's going to be willing to sell. And to buy, you need to sell. Yeah, it makes makes total sense. So there's is there is there anything else that you want to add on the uh, the Comex before we move on? No, only to keep an eye on my Twitter, then I'll make regular posts about it. If it's going to collapse, it's going to collapse around the start of the month or the end of the last month, uh, or again, towards the end of the current month, because their only obligation is to deliver every open interest that is left on the last day. So if there is going to be a delivery failure, it's most likely going to happen on the last day, but it can't rule anything out. Perfect. Perfect. All right. So as the, uh, let's say discrepancy in data um, Mm -hmm. theme progresses, you've also noticed some very interesting things in Tether. So tell us about your your prediction there. Right. Well, so uh, in May, I started suspecting that the Bitcoin run up might not be um, genuine because I'm well aware of Tether and everyone in the crypto space is well aware of Tether and Tether is a total scam. If you don't believe me, just go to the Wikipedia and do everything that somebody, everyone else isn't doing. Just read it. Just read the history of Tether. It is so screwed up. There's no way in hell this is genuine. Now, uh, there were already questions as to whether Tether, which is a stable coin, so it's backed one-to-one by dollars, supposedly, at le- allegedly at this point, um, there were already questions whether they had that money or not. So in 2018, in the middle, they uh, the middle year, they did um, an audit, quote unquote audit, because they hired a legal firm, which is not an auditing firm. They said so that it's not an auditing firm. Uh, they even said that they cannot verify anything of this ver- information being genuine. All the information came from uh, just the sources of Tether. Uh, it was non-GAAP. Uh, and nobody should construe anything about how much money they have on the audit. All that document proves, according to the legal form or legal firm that did it, is that at the moment they did the supposed audit, Tether showed them two bank accounts with this amount of money in it, and we can verify that we saw the money was in it at that time. That's all the audit proves. Sketchy as fuck. But people bought it. So uh, even though uh, Tether went down a lot, uh, it didn't get destroyed. And it's, it just hang around, hang around the bottom for a long time. However, crashes matter, especially to scams. Uh, we saw that in 2008 when Bernie Madoff blew up uh, by no other reason that people took the money out of his supposed funds uh, because they thought it was invested in the market, and the market went south. Had they just left this money with him, they actually would have gotten richer because he had it all in cash. He had never made a trade in his life. Same thing happened to Tether. So um, Tether, the scam basically works 
by uh, printing Tether, which people think are worth a dollar, but you can also buy Bitcoin for dollars and Tether. So if Bitcoin is $10,000, it's also 10,000 Tethers. So since they can just print Tethers, they have been printing Tethers and buying Bitcoin. And whenever they need dollars to, uh, to uh, satisfy their dollar denominated loans, they'll just sell Bitcoin into the market and use the dollar proceeds to satisfy the loans. However, aside from the crash in March, which may have been caused by Tether uh, being forced to liquidate its holdings into the open market, dropping Ethereum by 85% in a day and Bitcoin by 66% in a day. Um, after that, it stabilized again and the price started rising again. What the scam needs is a forever rising price. Now, the main thing that happened after the crash in March is that Tether's market cap started going exponential. Now, it's very important for people to realize that Tether as a stable coin is pegged one to one uh, to the dollar. So one Tether is one dollar and one dollar is one Tether permanently. Well, as long as people believe it to be true. So if, if there's a million, just, yeah. just before yeah, we move so. on there on, on that point, would that, would the point of it being backed by dollars be that at some point you can exchange it for that dollar? Uh, theoretically, yes, but uh, I've seen people, well, I've, and on the Wikipedia, it just states that somebody has done research in this. And ever since uh, the to start of 2019, they haven't been able to find a single redemption or purchase by any consumer or tether. So uh, we don't know where they're coming from, but they're just printing it. And then just selling tethers into the open market for uh, dollars or whoever will take it. I'm not entirely sure about their uh, fraud structure, but because it's all digital and they can just directly transfer stuff with bots, I am sure it is complex. So what has happened since uh, March, since the March crash, is that Tether had a market cap of 4 billion uh, on January 1st, 4.5 billion on January 2nd, uh, January uh, 6th, by the way. So uh, the scam was already cracking even before the virus. However, um, the scam, or it, it is a scam, but the market cap went from 4.5 billion to 6 billion, to 8 billion, to 10 billion, to 13 billion. And then it's just started running up and it's almost 20 billion tethers now. And since one tether is still valued and $1, they have effectively counterfeited $20 billion. And this will probably make it the largest counterfeiting scam in history. So, what and is it? go ahead. Oh, well, uh, I wanted to bring it back to your point of supposedly being backed by dollars. Again, on the Wikipedia, it says on the 30th of April 2019, Tether Limited's own lawyer admitted that they had zero points seventy four dollars in cash and cash equivalents for each Tether. So even in 2019, when the market cap was 2.8 billion, they only had 74% of that 2.8 billion in cash or cash equivalents. And naturally they're gonna count crypto as a cash equivalent, because why the hell not? And uh, the other third, uh, the other quarter that uh, was just uh, in nothing apparently, is in credits or loans given out to other companies. Well, they have a $900 million loan out to Bitfinex, which was supposedly be a separate company, but the Panama Papers revealed that Tether and Bitfinex are the same company. Uh, the owners of Bitfinex started Tether. And on the July 17th, uh, they ruled that um, Bitfinex was supposed to turn over documents, and as a result of the ruling, they uh, froze the loan Tether made to them, so Tether could not get its, 700, uh, its $900 million back. Six days uh, later, well, five days later even, on July 22nd, Tether market cap jumps by $900 million. It's so blatant, and everybody still thinks it's legit. Well, fine, fine. You know what? I'll give them the 900 million, but I won't give them two bill, uh, 20 billion. There's no way in hell that they have 20 billion in either Bitcoin 
or crypto or whatever. They, they have a shit ton of crypto on the balance sheet. And the only reason they say it's backed by $20 billion is because crypto is currently valued at this much. If Bitcoin goes to half, Tether blows up. So that was actually going to be my next question is, is what, what the, like say the, the cracking point for Tether could be? It's already cracked. Their printing rate, uh, basically I've been uh, looking at the uh, circulating supply every single day and uh, for a very long time. I've been taking screenshots too. I have evidence as usual. And um, their printing rate between November the 1st and December 1st was approximately $30 billion a year. So if they kept up that rate of increasing their market cap, they would print $30 billion worth of Tether each year. That rate has since cratered to about eight to nine billion a year. So it has uh, cut down to a third, basically, out of nowhere. And the only reason I can think of that happening right after the rally going all the way up to 19K and now 24K. They must have run into some sort of behind the scenes limitation because Ponzi schemes always need uh, an exponential amount of greater fools. Now that doesn't, exp- that doesn't really mean uh, money. It just means that if they're selling Bitcoin for dollars, they need somebody to take the Bitcoin so they can get the dollars to satisfy the dollar needs. If nobody accepts the Bitcoin, they can't get dollars, they go bust. Uh, that's one instance, for instance. So uh, one of the questions I have that I just can't figure out is who the hell is accepting all these Tether into the market? I do know that they're all going to Bitfinex and Bitfinex uh, puts them into small wallets and the small wallets distribute them across other exchanges. I have found a very good website that I wish to promote. No affiliation, but uh, it's called the Flipside Cooperative, and they analyze crypto data uh, transfer flows. So uh, it's just a bunch of dots on the chart. The dots go from one source to another. And if you just look at the animation, you can kind of follow where uh, all the money is going. And that's also how I found that the Bitcoin rally is, in fact, a bag holder rally, because the flip side shows me uh, the wallets associated by so-called whales, wallets that have a lot in them, small wallets, uh, which don't have a lot in them, and the exchange wallets. So you can actually track Bitcoin going from uh, the miners to say DeFi or Binance or uh, Hyobi or uh, small wallets or large wallets. It's, it's, It's an amazing site. However, In their animation, they showed that during the entire November run-up of the price in Bitcoin, the whales have sold, um, I don't know what the amount is now, but between, oh God, what was it? Uh, October 5th and December 5th, especially from October 26th onward. And you can definitely see that start start of the animation still today. The whales have moved 1.4 million Bitcoin to small wallets. Not just the whales, but exchanges as well, because a lot of the stuff on the exchanges has gone to Binance. Binance is basically retail doing leveraged trades. So it's retail too. Now, I don't know how much uh, the whales have sold in total, but I do know that I have observed that between the 5th of October and the 5th of December, small wallets have added 1.4 million Bitcoin. Now, this would be fine if this was a legitimate rally, but if it was a legitimate rally, I would expect to see a movement from small wallets to big wallets, big wallets to small wallets, people buying Bitcoin, waiting, taking profits, uh, uh, buying back, waiting, getting profits, et cetera, et cetera. You would expect movement back and forth. That is not what is, that is not what is happening. What is happening is a one-way stream from whales to small wallets. They are not holding. They are selling down everything they have. Now, I don't know how much uh, Bitcoin is in the wallets themselves. Flipside doesn't tell me. So naturally, the whales are probably going to have much more than 1.4 million Bitcoin. My point is that the transfer flows within the uh, latest run-up all are outflows from whales into small wallets, giant amounts. Uh, just a few days ago on the 13th, uh, almost 100,000 Bitcoins transferred in a day. 
That is not the behavior of somebody who is holding on because he thinks it's going to go up in value. That is somebody who's selling it to strength because the suckers are going to be holding the bag, basically. But well, that's like, how far I got it. <laughs> it's uh, like like the Comex situation. It's gonna going to take time to tell oh God. How, how this plays out, right? Oh God, you triggered a memory. I just went, uh, just, um, we were supposed to do this interview a little bit earlier, but uh, something was wrong with the time. So I was just reading on the internet. I got into Bitcoin futures. Uh, this is just fresh off the press. The CME group is pumping up the Bitcoin with with futures too. Oh God, yes, they are. They have, uh, each contract on the CME group's website is five Bitcoin. They have about 11K open interest uh, for deliverable for the next two months. Or, well, I don't know if it can be delivered, but if it's on the COMEX, I suppose it's deliverable. If it's not, why the hell is there even a futures contract? Anyway, COMEX is supposed to be a production hedging tool. They have an open interest, uh, about 60K worth of Bitcoin, no, 50K worth of Bitcoin for the next two months in open interest. So if everybody buys all the open interest on the COMEX in Bitcoin, not even, not even silver and gold, but Bitcoin, they have to deliver 50K worth of Bitcoin. The mining rate for Bitcoin right now, after the last happening, is 900 per day. You do that uh, times 44 days, the time they have left to deliver those contracts, you get to 40K. So Bitcoin futures on the CME are already 20% over levered. That's if everybody stands for delivery. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, Bitcoin isn't printed that much. Mathematically, it's impossible to deliver that. Now, naturally, somebody can sell the Bitcoin, but at that point, somebody needs to be willing to sell the Bitcoin. And it gets even worse because I found a site which shows me Bitcoin futures volume across multiple exchanges because Binance is the biggest and there's others uh, offering futures as well. So comics already can't deliver. Futures open interest has exploded to well beyond gold. That is how I got to the article. And uh, this gets even worse. COMEX is the third largest when it comes to open interest, but as far as trade volume goes, it is like the seventh or eighth. It beats Hyobi in open interest in Bitcoin futures, and it, it has like the eighth largest place in volume, like two or three percent of trading volume, and a Hyobi has like 30 or 20 percent or something, something ridiculously high. So uh, a COMEX should not have this amount of futures for the amount of trading volume they have compared to every other exchange that offers futures and the trading volume they have and the amount of futures they have. It's just a fucking mess. I, I am just, all, I, I'm not ready to call anything because I just found it uh, a few hours ago, but it looks like comics is pumping up the price as well. Oh God. Well, I guess, uh, I guess we're going to have to just watch and see how, again, how that, how that uh, situation progresses. Um, yep. Why don't we move on to the hyperinflation ideas that you have, and this is going to be um, probably better viewed on the on the YouTube video because we'll have some charts and uh, and numbers to um, support it. As always, I go through the data. Yes, let's do hyperinflation because two scams that are going to ruin the economy isn't enough. <laughs> let's do a third one. So, uh, to my Canadian viewers, which includes Tom, who is a Canadian, I am very sorry. But I think Canada is going to be the first one that hyperinflates. I've got a lot of data on the screen. Don't worry. As usual, I will talk you through every single step of the way. Rich, just let me get a drink first. This is going to take a while. So, at some point, I wanted to find a new way to see uh, if I could track inflation in some sort of way in bonds. So I thought, why not uh, find out if there's a website that shows me the spread, not between the various treasuries, but between uh, the US 10-year and, say, the Greek 10-year? Because I've been tracking that, my Twitter followers will know. So um, I found this website. Uh, I haven't listed it here, but it's okay. Um, which lists just every country and the spread of their 10-year to the spread of the tenure of the US. Now, I didn't expect to find anything interesting right off the bat, but when I went to Canada specifically, I came upon uh, basically the top left uh, row of the maturity 
of each year of um, a Canadian bond and the spread with their equivalent of the United States. And as you can see, something very peculiar uh, showed up. The long end of Canada, the seven year to the 30 year treasuries are uh, trading at a discount to the American uh, longer dated treasuries. But the short dated uh, stuff is trading at a premium, a considerable premium, I might add. It's best showed uh, as well as the chart in the middle here, the Can Canada versus United States spread values. You can see that this is positive up to the five year and then it goes uh, negative up to the 30 year. And this is very peculiar because as I wrote up here, I've been tracking the Greek government bonds because I just like to harp on Twitter that the US 10 year is supposed to be the safest investment instrument in the entire world. Yet it trades at about 0.9% yield and the Greek 10 year is trading at less than 0.6% yield. So it's like 30 or 40% more expensive at this point than the safest investment in the world. And as anybody will know, the interest rate on the bond is reflective of the risk on the bond. The higher uh, the chance of default, the higher the uh, interest rate because the more risk you don't get your money back. Implying that the Greek 10 year is 40% less likely to default than the, the US 10 year. I just find that fun. <laughs> so, anyway, I started looking around on this site and I came to a very disturbing conclusion very quickly. And that is that the Canada pattern does not line up with any of the other patterns. Every single country I go to looks like uh, has either, a, a, well, basically has a negative spread across the board. All the lines are green or all the lines are red, but it's not split. Um, and we get to the other two charts here. This uh, Desel, is- be Before we move yes. on, what does this spread really signify to us? Is that just the, the risk on the longer dated stuff? Well, uh, no, it like, goes to like what why I, is this important for our for our listeners to understand? It, it, um, I'm going to have to weave this all together, so it will make more sense in a moment. Okay. But at the moment, you just have to concentrate on the fact that if the interest rate is higher, it's more likely that there will be a default. Mm -hmm. uh, if the interest rates on both instruments are very low, then naturally the overall chance of default is very low, but the chance for one country is still higher than for the other. So uh, the fact that the 10-year of Canada is trading uh, at a premium to the 10-year of the US says that the, U uh, that the Canada is less likely to default in the next 10 years than the US. However, since on the short end, the two-year trades at a discount to the two-year of the US, it sell tells me that Canada will go bankrupt faster than the US in two years. This clearly is a disconnect. And uh, that is what I'm uh, going to come to because I as well had problem uh, understanding why is this disconnect there. Um, but the website offers another graph or another set of stats, and that is the CDS or credit default swap market. Now, if your country is going to go bankrupt, the credit default swaps are going to go up in price because that is the way you protect yourself against somebody else going bankrupt. They go bankrupt, you get the payout of the instrument. If they don't get bankrupt, uh, you just pay for the instrument, but it doesn't give you anything. So it's basically an option. Now, when you look at the options of all countries, all the CDS, the five-year CDS across all developed uh, economies, they all show the same pattern, which is the one in the middle here, the one of the United States. There was a jolt in March when it was looking like everything was going to die. But uh, calm returned with the Fed in the markets. So CDS went down again, it went up again. But ever since then, it has been declining. And if you look at every single country on the uh, site, which is the uh, list up there, which I'll get to in a moment, all of them will show you the exact same pattern. I've checked Australia, Germany, United Kingdom, Greece, Italy, Mexico, 
all kinds, of, even Turkey, even Turkey shows this pattern where uh, it is shit in around March, then it goes down a bit, uh, and Turkey has problems with hyperinflation, so they went sideways since, but they haven't uh, gone up. And if you look at the Canadian CDS value ever since November, even though it isn't a lot, it has only gone up. And that brings, up, brings us to the list up here, which is the list of the five-year credit default swaps for all, well, not all countries, but uh, a lot of the major ones. You can see uh, the top of the list, the AA, triple A rated countries, the most safe investments in the world, Denmark, my country, the Netherlands, uh, Austria, Germany, Norway, Sweden, names you know, names you know to be safe. And you can see the CDS is really low. Denmark even breaking the uh, 10. Uh, Norway is 11. Sweden is 12. Finland is 12.9. Belgium is 13. Then you get the US is 14. Uh, New Zealand 14. Japan 15, etc., etc. But then to get to Canada, you have to go all the way up to 36.6. Now, as an absolute value, it may not be that much. Turkey went up to 600 uh, basis points uh, in the crash in March. So clearly there are steps closer to hyperinflation and closer to default. However, if you just look at the list and I'll even zoom in on this, so it's very clear. All the countries at the top, you would expect this list since it goes to the likelihood of default of the country you would expect the list to be ordered on the basis of ratings because the triple A countries are the least likely to default and the triple B or the single B rated countries are the most likely to default. As you can see, Turkey is rated B plus and Denmark is rated triple A. You go down this list uh, and countries start getting downgraded. Uh, there's gonna be a little bit of variations because the numbers are so small. For instance, Australia is 14.58 uh, and New Zealand is 14.00. And it doesn't take a lot to switch those positions. So that is fine. But below Australia, you get Japan, France, United Kingdom, Ireland, South Korea, China. China with its giant debt bu bubbles and housing markets and everything. We're already to the A plus rated because the United States is AA plus. Uh, New Zealand is AA, uh, Ireland is AA minus, China is A plus, and then uh, 7.6 basis points below China, worse than China, is Canada with its triple A rating. Directly below them, only 2.4 points higher is Portugal with a triple B rating. In, in, in credit worthiness. Below that, not, not even six points higher, is Hong Kong with its protests since 2019, its takeover by the Chinese, its capital flight, its protesters getting the hell out. They're just six points above Canada. This is insanity. Canada has no business being AAA rated anymore. So doesn't that make the risk of any of the countries that are below that, like Portugal, Hong Kong, Spain, um, Poland, and, and the other ones there, doesn't that make them more susceptible to that default risk, do you think? Uh, naturally, because you're still dealing with absolute values. Uh, if uh, something has 30 basis points of five years to yes, and another thing has 60 basis points, the other country is twice as likely to default. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, in the grand scheme of things, the 60 basis point country is less likely to default than the 600 basis point country. Of course. So, but because it's all relative, you would expect the triple A rated countries to be at the top of the list. So since Canada is triple A rated, you would expect it to have a CDS range between 9.40 and let's say 20. Let's be generous here. Uh, that would put it above South Korea with 21.71. Mm -hmm. That would seem reasonable to me. But Canada is nowhere near that. Canada's nearly double 20. It's, it's nearing 40. If it goes up again, it's going to crash 40 easy. Mm -hmm. And the reason why this is a black swan prediction, a black, level, a black swan level event, is because nobody thinks Canada's going to default or hyperinflate at all. 
not within a short time period. Maybe in 10 years, people say, well, I'll be out of everything long by then. It's not going to take 10 years. It's not going to take 10 months. Because, and here we go to another part of the chart, is what I have uh, put down here, which is the monetary base of Canada. Because naturally, uh, since the CDS is showing me, and oh, oh, I'll go back to this again just to show you, there is no debating this. All right, this is an absolute list of value. This is a screenshot I made on the 11th of December. It is clear, you can see this, in the variation of six months, every single country is down in uh, default risk. Every single one, except Canada, which is up 11%. Hmm. I mean, that list here tells me that this isn't even a prediction. I am late to the party. If I, had, uh, if I was uh, any good at this, maybe I'm better than everybody else. <laughs> But I am still slower than reality because you can see here before October, there was a little bit of an uptick in CDS and it's been slowly rising since April. If I uh, was smarter, I would have called all of this in October and I would have predicted the November rise. So I, this is not even a debate. I am late to the party. This isn't even a prediction. This is just a conclusion. So let's go into uh, why this is happening and the effects that it will later have. We will we'll, uh, handle how you can protect yourself later. Remind me that uh, we get back to that. So first off, Canadian M1 money supply. What is an M1 money supply? Well, you have to, uh, have, well, we say we pay with cash. Well, what is cash? A check is a cash, but it's not a bill. So how do you define what is an, or isn't uh, the most liquid of means of payment? Well, that is how we define the M1. And uh, the M1 is basically the currency in circulation. Uh, for lack of better terms, without going too complicated, that is what you can state. As you can see from the very clear screenshot, M1, para, uh, M1 of Canada, uh, Canada has gone parabolic. Uh, even faster than the curve I've drawn, the situation's even worse. I'm being generous here. Now, as I wrote on the screenshot, in the entirety of history, no parabolic curve has ever been a legitimate business. So since the Canadian M1 money supply depicts the Canadian dollar or CAD, the CAD is no longer a legitimate business. And I don't give a fuck what anybody says. Exponential curves don't lie. So, but to continue, why no one is expecting this is because of the Canadian 10-year bond yield. You can see there's a cup forming. It is slowly rising. This is already affecting the economy. I have a friend in Hong Kong who is uh, going to emigrate uh, to Canada because of the, pre, uh, the previously mentioned troubles. And he's been doing research into Canada, like I've been telling him to do. And he says that uh, he only sees memes about skyrocketing prices and food inflation. So the populace is aware that this is happening. They're just not connecting the dots yet because there's no generalized information source. Uh, there's no trigger event just yet. But that does mean that we will see slow rises in bonds. Even though, again, the Greek bond is about 30% cheaper than the um, uh, Canadian 10-year. It's 40% over the US 10-year, but it's still 30% over the Canadian 10-year. So that's, that's already insane because Greece is not financially healthy. UA, the Europa will collapse too, but we still have a few months, so I'm saving that for a future video. Now, uh, I want to in, interject in this picture just for a moment to show you, uh, to compare this against a situation that's already gone under control. Turkey has already started hyperinflation. Uh, well, maybe not hyperinflation, but severe cases of inflation at any case. So they are a country which has statistics of a country that has been fighting inflation for quite a while. So if we look at the pattern of that 10 year, that should show us what will happen within hyperinflation. I've got that up uh, right here. You can see the Turkish 10 year bond yield has gone from uh, almost 20% in 2018. This is a, a weekly chart. Uh, down to the uh, start of 2019, it was 13%. Then it went up to uh, almost 20% again in uh, May of 2019. Then it dropped all the way down to 10% in the start of 2020. And then it was just a, 
horrible, horrible seesaw uh, until it is right now at 13%. That is clearly a country that's been fighting inflation. And you can see this in their currency as well, the exchange rate between the dollar and the Turkish lira, which has over the past, well, the monthly chart is obvious. It has gone from uh, a bottom of 1.7 in 2011 to a high, a recent high of 8.3. So it lost about eight times its value, give or take. Um, well, this is a country fighting inflation. You can see this is also curving up exponentially. And as soon as Turkey runs out of gold to sell, because the only way this is going down is if they're selling everything that is not nailed down uh, to support the currency, that's going to end soon. And then currency and Turkey's going to hyperinflate as well. But because they have a bond yield that has been fighting inflation and they have no problems raising it. Well, the previous guy didn't, but Erdogan fired him. Uh, so um, it's basically a process that is already underway for this country and they're doing everything to mitigate that process. But if we go back to the picture, you can clearly see that Canada is not a country that is doing anything to stop inflation at this point in time. Because the M1 curve, they're just printing money as crazy, but the bonds are at the bottom of history. They're at historic lows still. Uh, it's, it's insanity. It's absolute insanity. And uh, next to that, you have the uh, Canadian uh, dollar versus the US dollar. Uh, I've, I've used the Canadian USD pair because it's more obvious. Uh, the Canadian dollar is still rising against the US dollar. But like I wrote, it, it has no business rising against the dollar. And uh, if you want to ask a question, because I know I can go on a long time before we get into faith. Do you have any questions? Uh, I think my only question would be, how do we protect ourselves from this? Oh, oh we'll go to that in a moment. But um, <laughs> when this starts, and this is going to start soon if it hasn't started already, um, the problem is how do you stop it? Because you hear every central bank, oh, we'll just raise rates. Well, first of all, they can't raise rates because then the interest expense on the debt they already have explodes. Mm -hmm. uh, but regardless of that, they're still going to try. But there is one extremely key thing that you need to get through your head, which is also important to how to protect yourself. Inflation and hyperinflation are different by only one key factor. And that is that hyperinflation is psychological while inflation has to deal with supply and demand. As there are more dollars versus less assets or the same amount of assets, the, amount, uh, the value of dollars goes down. Simple supply and demand, more supply, same demand, lower price. That is inflation. Hyperinflation becomes a mind game where every single person will, will not want to hold the Canadian dollar at any price. They will want to get rid of it at any cost, which means that they're going to, you're going to see some weird shit happening when this gets started because people are going to throw money at everything that cannot be printed, regardless of whether it has value or not. That is the first capital flight that happens. Capital does not have to flee out of a country. It can also flee into assets mm -hmm. as long as it's not in cash. That is capital flight out of cash. And that's what we're going to get. That's what we're going to get. When that happens, naturally, gold is going to go up. That, I don't even need to say this to anybody. This is something that every human understands innately. Don't let anybody tell you different. You understand this by pure instinct why gold is going to go up. So I'm not even going to discuss it. However, uh, this also goes for a na national level. If we want to support, the, if we want to stop the Canadian dollar from hyperinflating, you don't stop printing. Makes no sense. Makes no use. It is psychological. It has nothing to do with supply and demand. So when hyperinflation gets started, if they stop the printing presses, that doesn't matter. Whatever currency is out there is still going to decrease in value because nobody wants to hold it anymore. The only reason it doesn't happen instantly is because humans change their minds at a different rate to each other. Some people are not going to be quick to adapt 
some people, <laughs> well, like me, I can say, are extremely fast. So I will not touch the Canadian dollar from this point onward until this chart right here shows a positive line in the many double digital tons of gold. The chart you're looking at here is the gold reserves of the Central Bank of Canada, which is a well-known uh, fact within the gold industry and the gold and silver bullion industry. The Central Bank of Canada holds no gold. No one knows why they do it. They're the only central bank that don't do it. They're a bunch of fucking morons. They're not doing it because it's going to get the economy killed. And I'm sorry if I'm being harsh, but this is going to kill people. All right. You need to understand this. People are going to starve because they can't afford food, even if it is there. And that has to do with the central bank's inability to support the faith in the currency once it goes. I know what everybody says. Canada is a commodity exporter. They have it in the ground. Well, fine. But if you need something now and you're going to say, I, the, 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 the Canada, the, the, it's worthless. It's worthless. What are we going to do to support it? Well, we need gold for that. All right, we need gold now. When are we going to gonna get it? Well, it's going to take us 10 years to get it out of the ground. Well, then I'm going to say, well, I am not going to touch the Canadian dollar for the next 10 years. You have fun digging the gold out of the ground with whatever hyperinflation you're going to meet. I will invest in some other currency that wasn't stupid enough to have zero tons of gold. Yeah, it's pretty crazy to think that uh, a country that is so so rich in gold has gotten rid of it completely, even as as it is does provide such a, a hedge um, towards the currency and and for the central bank, right? It's not it's not even a hedge. It's the basis of value. Mm -hmm. People need to understand why we have currencies at all. It's because I can't determine how many bread I need to pay for a fish. I can't determine how many fish I need to pay for a bunch of shoes. I don't know how many buckets <laughs> it costs to buy an LCD TV. We need a central point of value where we all agree that has value. Mm -hmm. And gold is that central point of value because it's shiny. All right. There's, it, gold has a very few but very important properties that make it the quintessential money. One, it is shiny to everyone. And that sounds like an absolutely stupid argument, but let's, let me complex it a little bit. If I offer you, Tom, right now, one ounce gold for $1, would you take it? Of course. Right. Do you know anybody who would Especially not take Especially for a Canadian dollar. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Do you know anybody who would not take that deal? Um, I th I'm sure you could dig up a few. Yeah, well, the crazies in the institutions don't count and the central bankers don't either. Anyway, <laughs> uh, the point is there is a market bottom for gold. There is a price where every single person is going to buy it because he knows that every single other person values it higher. That creates a spread that creates profits. Gold is unique in that because we all think it's equally shiny. That is the key. Not that it is shiny. It is that we all think it's equally shiny. So we can relate to its value. We don't have to wonder if somebody thinks, for instance, that a haircut looks good or that gold looks good because it looks good. Haircuts are up for discussion, but the, va <laughs> the uh, look of gold is not. Mm -hmm. Yes, I know you're bald. Um, <laughs> however, uh, hey, my, my haircuts are pretty cheap, though. Yeah, yeah, got to get the buff. So though. let's let's <laughs> move on to how we how we protect ourselves, Sezo. Yeah, I, I'm I'm sorry, I tend to lose myself and just get lost in conversation. Um, people don't understand finance, and there's not enough time for me to teach everyone how to properly protect yourself because you're going to have to be quick on your feet. You're going to have to think about it. Sometimes you're going to have to sell something. Sometimes you're going to buy something, and uh, if you want to get rich, you can actually do that right now. Hyperinflation is a perfect time to get rich. Only the problem is uh, everybody else is going to get poor. And there's going to be a lot more and more poor people. So it's not a good be, going to be a good time for everyone. However, what we're going to do is we're going to gamify it. Everyone plays games except you. Uh, everyone loves games. So um, what we're going to do is play a very simple game. has a simple objective. Don't touch CAD. That's all you need to do. There are items in this game. Items that give you points 
but items that take points away from you as well. The item that takes points away is the deprecating stuff. Say a TV, you buy a new TV now, even if the this currency is stable in 10 years, it's going to be worth a lot less because new tech comes out. The new TVs will be better. They will not have been gone through wear and tear. So they will sell for more. So the TVs deprecate. Gold does not deprecate. The quintessential item to win this game of don't touch cat, silver. Why? Because a gold coin is already worth so much compared to a single loaf of bread that you can't exchange a gold coin for a single loaf of bread. Uh, you're going to you're gonna be able to buy 15,000 loaves of bread, but you can't eat 15,000 loaves of bread because silver is more prevalent, but it has the same properties as gold, not as good, but that drops the price, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Silver is the quintessential money for the poor people because you, if once everybody is playing this game, everybody is going to have the same objective. Don't touch CAD. When you have silver, you can give other people the ability to not touch cat. So if you drive out to a farmer's field because nobody has food anymore, and there's a giant line of people who are paying bar wheelbarrows full of cat, well, it's all gonna be digital, but imagine it in your head. You can walk past that entire line, go straight up to the farmer, and they're gonna, they're gonna be like, hey, hey, go back to the back. And you go, no, 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 mate. No, 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 I got silver. You're gonna go straight up to this farmer and you say, I got this coin here, and this coin allows you to not touch cat. And he's going to say, you're going to get all the food you want. Mm -hmm. Because because there are items that force you to touch CAD. So let's go down the chain a little bit. We have gold, we have silver, and we have, for instance, uh, other derivatives like platinum. Platinum does not have a monetary history, but because hyperinflation is psychological, that's why it was er uh, important earlier, it's not going to matter that platinum is industrial. All that's going to matter is that platinum comes out of the ground, it costs energy to dig it up, and you can't print it. Rarity is king. So platinum is going to do well as well, and it's going to beat inflation. The items that are less valuable are items that will beat inflation, but force you to touch CAD. Gold miners, perfect example. Gold miners are going to beat inflation because they are going to be selling gold at increasing prices that are going to beat inflation. So naturally, the amount of currency they collect is going to beat inflation. Uh, at the same time, they are going to pay out this currency to dividends. So if anybody owns a gold miner in the near future, they are going to get some crazy dividends in numbers at least. Value, not that much. However, these dividends are paid in CAD. So as soon as you get a dividend payment, you are touching CAD and you are losing the game. So what you need to do is the same thing as everyone else is doing. Get rid of CAD. Now, because dividends will come into a stock account, you can immediately buy more shares of the gold miner. Now, uh, shares of mining companies, of any company, can also be printed unlimitedly. And Rick Rule will happily tell you that they will happily do that even faster than inflation. So if you buy the wrong company, you're still going to lose out because they're going to deprecate the company even faster than the inflation. And yes, that will happen to some companies. So buy a good one, know what you're buying, do your research, do your due diligence. But if you then buy a gold miner, you're going to do very well. It's going to go up. Uh, well, no, physical is going to be king if you don't uh, hold it, you don't buy it. So the first thing you need to do, the first thing you need to secure for yourself right now before the video ends, go to a web shop in your local country, buy some silver coins. Uh, 100 ounces, if you can afford it, even 10 ounces, it will save your fucking life. Do that now. Listen to the rest later. Right, back to the miners. So when a miner pays you in CAD, you immediately put it back into the market. You don't put it into futures. That's a stupid idea. Yeah, just put it into another company. You got to remember that hyperinflation is a process, but it's also a short process. It won't last long. What you're aiming for, what you're aiming for within this game is the day hyperinflation ends, uh, they're just going to switch to another currency. They're going to switch to a gold standard when there's hyperinflation because we have that need for a central stable point of value. Humans will automatically find something else. I can't determine ahead of time what that will be. It could be euros. It could be US dollars before they hyperinflate six months later. Uh, it could be uh, gold, it could be silver. It could be uranium for all I know. It just depends on what's most convenient at that time, and we are not yet at that time, so I won't be able to tell. 
I just know that certain assets like gold and silver will do good regardless because of gold's properties that it doesn't interact with anything. You put it in a vault, you pull it out, it is exactly the same. So it's a non-deprecating asset. That's what makes it king. Also, again, uh, very important, get out of the banking system. Even safety deposit boxes are counted on the balance sheet of the banks. Don't use the safety deposit box. Find a private company with a private vault with a contract that guarantees you that economically speaking and legally speaking, the contents of your vault are always yours. So if the bank or if the company goes bankrupt and somebody else doesn't buy the business, you can just come and collect whatever is in the vault. That is why I have my vault in my uh, my uh, shit in my country. It's with a company that guarantees in every single situation whatever's in that vault. They don't even know it's a black box. It's mine. That's what that's the level of security you need to obtain. So um, there's another thing you need to do that is very important in hyperinflation. Get rid of adjustable debt. Get fixed rate now before they, the banks wise up and they stop offering it. Because as soon as hyperinflation starts, that is the very first thing that's going to go. The banks are going to notice something's up. They're going to stop offering fixed rate loans. And at this point, uh, adjustable rate debt is toxic waste and credit card debt is nuclear waste. Simply because when hyperinflation starts, uh, they're going to adjust the rates up. They're just going to adjust the rates faster than inflation. Currently, they're all locked to bonds because the bonds uh, just set the price because it's easier. But there's nothing stopping ca- credit card companies of not asking 20% rates or, uh, on the credit cards, but 40% or 60% or 100% or 20 million percent. They could just raise it forever. It's just a bunch of numbers. And the fools who are stuck holding adjustable rate debt will have to generate income that outpaces inflation and outpaces this uh, adjustable rate increase in order to just service the debt, not even pay it down. So uh, eventually those people will get rid of the debt, but only when the entire economy collapses or they go personally bankrupt. However, when you convert it to fixed rate, something else entirely happens. Say you loan $100,000 today. I'm not saying you should do this, just an example. Say you loan $100,000 today at a 10% fixed rate over the next 10 years. Hyperinflation happens. Incomes go up. They go up lagging inflation. So that is why hyperinflation is such a problem. The incomes will go up because it takes time to redetermine an income and renegotiate a contract. It just lags inflation because inflation happens every single day. If you loan 100K and you pay 10% interest, then you pay 10K. But because it's a fixed rate, you always pay 10K on the original 100K you loaned. So if when incomes go up, and they go up severely because you're going to see the same thing as Venezuela and Zimbabwe and Argentina. You're going to see bread go up to $100, 200 2000 20000 20 million, 20 billion. Uh, uh, same as Weimar Germany. Uh, Australia went, uh, no, Australia. Austria went six months before Weimar Germany. And it's the same thing's going to happen to Canada and US because uh, history never repeats, but it often rhymes. So, When your income, whatever that income is, if you don't lose it, even if you just sell a silver coin, that is going to go up tremendously. You're not going to have any trouble paying down $100,000 pretty soon because the currency just isn't worth that much anymore. Everyone wants to get rid of it. And if you needed to pay down a loan, well, you have no problem getting it at a very cheap price. But because your uh, rate was fixed all this time, you still only owe $10,000 uh, on the loan because it's 10% interest. Still, when you can pay off 100000 without a problem. So if any, I had a question about this actually today, a uh, guy from New, uh, Norway, I think. He has a lot of student debt, but they offered him to consolidate it all into one big fixed rate loan for 10 years at an interest rate of 1.933%. I told him, you do that. You lock that shit in today because the banks are still offering it and they're complete fucking morons that they do because that's going to cost them a lot of money and their loss is your gain. And even if I'm wrong, even if I'm wrong and rates crater from here, they go down all the way to 0% for 30 years. Are you really, really going to regret 
paying 2% interest over 10 years on a loan? After 10 years, you look back at that. Are you going to regret that? Because if you, go with, if you go with adjustable, then you're betting for the next 10 years, the rates stay this low with all of this on the screen. Now- Doesn't I, seem like a very likely uh, outcome. No, and this was just Canada. Uh, we'll just quickly run through the everything else because I've talked too much already, I know, but there's yeah, so we- much else going on. Uh, just the M1 money stock from uh, the US dollar has just been updated. Now that you know what the M1 does, I can run through it quickly. It has spiked tremendously like uh, since November. It was 5.7 trillion on the 16th of November, and it is now 6.5 trillion. So it went up by uh, 800 billion. I think, yeah, let's say 800 billion uh, in um, less than a month. That's just new circulating currency causing inflation, yes. Uh, more interesting though, after this increase, uh, M1 went up a little bit more. Now M2 is the less cashier of cash, as you saw, as it shows down here. It includes saving deposits, small denominated deposits, but most importantly, Balances in Retail Monet Market Mutual Funds, MMFs. So I've looked this up and there has been a giant outflow of money out of MMFs this entire year. Uh, the inflow in ETFs is covering up for it, but the MMFs are being drained considerably. So when, it's, uh, when the M1 spiked uh, the last two weeks, uh, M2 stayed the same and actually went down a bit. That means that M2 money, less liquid money, was converted to M1 money, more liquid money. This is also one of the earliest signs of hyperinflation. And to make matters worse, in the very recently updated data, so this is hot off the presses, uh, M2 jumped from 19 trillion to 19.2 trillion. So it went up by 200 billion, while M1 went still up instead. In the start of the year, I was also tracking M1. And what you saw, that was what the M1 went up, M2 went down. When the M2 and when the M1 went down, M2 went up. There was like this play back and forth while they were still going up sideways. This is a change in that pattern because the M1 and M2 are both going up considerably in the same month. And while <laughs> this is happening, the dollar index is absolutely going through the floor. It already cracked 90. And uh, according to this pattern, it's going to go much lower. The weekly chart is awful. The monthly chart is awful. It's just plain awful. Once it cracks, uh, let's say 88 and a half, it's going to go all the way down to 80. There's no resistance here. It's just going to fall. Uh, do I have anything else? Uh, no. Oh, well, one thing, the BNN article. So uh, I made this prediction, actually, like you could see on the um, screenshot, uh, 11 December. And this came out just yesterday. Inflation accelerates in Canada too fastest since pandemic hit. And I was on Twitter. Yeah, no shit. Yeah, it's a good, uh, good um, confirmation of exactly what you're saying, right, Dezo? Yeah. Uh, again, after I called it. Now, uh, I want to uh, want to say one thing, by the way. Uh, Alistair McLeod has been doing amazing work on all of this and hyperinflation. You should go read his work on goldmoney.com. It's under the research section. He has written a lot of hyperinflation in uh, the US and in the EU. I don't know if he touched on Canada yet. He might have, but I've been very busy, so I haven't had time to read at all. But I did read this article on hyperinflation in the US and the EU. But an imminent default of Canada, I don't know if he's written about that yet, but he should. Well, it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. And uh, hopefully we can, you know, educate some of our, our listeners to really figure out where to capture some of the value that they currently have in these fiat currencies, right? Yeah, well, it's very simple. Just don't hold, don't hold the currencies. You can find me at uh, Desert Games on Twitter. Or my website, desertgames.com, which has been made since last time. Uh, please read my articles. I spend a lot of time and effort on it. And the article I'm most proud of 
is not the shadow contracts article. It's the virtual labor article. I would beg you to read it because it shows you that there is an actual way to a digital store of labor value and video games of all places have already created it. Uh, I have a very long history of video games. I'm a hardcore gamer. I've been playing video games since I was six years, uh, six months old. And my father put me on his lap in front of the Commodore 64. And I was instantly fascinated. When I was three years old, when I couldn't even form sentences properly yet, I learned how to type. So I am a quintessentially a gamer. I spent so much uh, time gaming and I've consolidated all that experience, combined it with my economic experience and created a very interesting article about how the world of War how World of Warcraft Gold is more valuable than the United States dollar right now. Interesting. Well, uh, we encourage all of our uh, listeners to go head over to DezoGames.com and give that a read. Thanks very much for your time today, Dezo. Uh, don't forget, forget to follow me on Twitter and... Pretty soon, I will be relaunching my Twitch streams. So twitch.tv slash games. Give it a follow. You can sub if you want, but you don't have to yet. I will be doing sub-only streams very soon. I am dealing with some amazing deals. I am going to be filthy rich very soon. And it's all going to be revealed very soon. So just give me a follow there and it all will work out. Excellent. Thanks for your time today, Dezo. And thank you for the opportunity. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.